If you have your Bible, turn to Daniel 2 with me tonight, please. Verse 31. In Daniel chapter number 2 and verse 31, the scripture says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Terrible in the sense that it instills terror. Not the way the word terrible is used in the English language today on the street. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name we pray. Amen. This is the, the well-known image that, De that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And it represents the Gentile kingdoms from 606 B.C. to the second advent. Not the rapture, but the second coming. Because the stone that's come out of the mountain, that's cut out of the mountain, smites the image and destroys the Gentile kingdoms. The rapture doesn't do that. The rapture catches us up to meet him in the clouds in a uh, mysterious, personal appearing of Christ only for his bride. And we're gone. But seven years later, he comes again and the heaven opens and he comes in power and great glory to smite the image of the Gentile kingdoms on their feet. And when he does, they come to an abrupt end. In chapter number 2 and verse number 43, the Bible says, that Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. I talked about this in Sunday school this morning. We've been talking about the genealogies of Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. These two genealogies are very important. One of them is a royal genealogy, Matthew 1. The other one is the genealogy that traces Christ's mother, more than likely, Mary, all the way back to Adam. The reason it is so important is because the curse comes through the seed of the man, through the father, Therefore, in Genesis 3.15, the prophecy says the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. So it, therefore, the seed is not the seed of a man, but it's the seed of a woman. It's got to be a supernatural seed. It's got to be something from above that's altogether different from anything that we understand because it is biologically impossible for the woman to have the seed. The seed is the seed of God. God's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Genesis 3.15 demands a virgin birth. Because the seed of the woman, therefore, eliminates the human father on this earth. And as I said to you a moment ago, the seed comes through the man. The curse comes through the man. And, and from generation to generation, the curse is passed down through the man. Therefore, God is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we've got a seed showing up here in the book of Daniel, chapter number 2. And this is going to mix itself with the seed of men. It is a corruption of the human race. It has something to do with the supernatural intervention from somewhere upon humanity, upon mankind. And we see that happening around us right now because the whole world is, 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 is literally sinking into the abyss like I have never seen it in my lifetime. In CERN, Switzerland, as I told the Sunday school class this morning, that 17 mile long ring, about 300 feet below the surface of the earth, the largest man-made machine in the world. This thing is colliding proton particles together, along with some others. And they have discovered recently there is the presence of something inside there that shouldn't be there. And they don't want to say too much about this, but something is happening at CERN that they did not expect. Bertolucci, who is the director of CERN, says that we may very well open doors into a different dimension. Black holes, in other words, going to the unknown, to the unseen. And we may go over into that dimension or something from that dimension may come over into where we are. Could that be the seed that mingles itself with the sons of men? 
We don't know. We know this. We know that something supernatural is about to happen on this earth that's never happened before. And men had better get ready for the Bible says that it's a time of deception unlike any other time that the world has ever known. Deception characterizes the last days. Men and deceive, men, men and, uh, shall deceive and being deceived. And they are being deceived and they are deceiving. And that's happening right now while you are listening to this preacher tonight. You can't believe anybody anymore. You can't believe your politicians. You can't believe your government. You can't believe anybody. You can't even believe people that you go, that you work with, or your neighbors, or your family members, or your friends, or uh, people that are close to you. You can't believe people anymore. Lying is an epidemic in this country. And the reason for that is because the whole moral character of America has been destroyed. The Bible prophecy that we're talking about here tonight is very important. It's important to understand this about the Middle East. There are three major powers in the Middle East right now. One of them is Turkey. The other one is Iran. And the other one is this wild, fanatical, Muslim-killing machine called ISIS. The United States had defeated uh, Saddam Hussein in the Iraq War. And when Barack Obama became the president, he pulled our troops out. When he pulled the troops out, he created a vacuum in that area of the country. They were quick to fill the vacuum. ISIS, therefore, established a year ago, they announced an Islamic state, a caliphate. And the purpose of that, of course, is to promote Islam as the major religion of the world, and one day it will rule the world. You can see them carry their banners, and they, make no, they, don't, they don't hide it. They say on the banner, Islam will rule the world. Now, we have some big players in this thing at the end of time. One of them is, is uh, Iran. The other one is uh, uh, Turkey. If you go back in your history just a little bit, you'll find out that both of these countries represent what at one time was a huge empire. The empire of Persia was centered in Iran. Persia, under Cyrus, was the first king that ever gave Israel the right to go back and rebuild their temple, go back to their land, gave them their land back. Cyrus. This happened when God showed him his name in the book of Isaiah that was in there hundreds of years before he was ever born. That blew his mind when he saw his name in a Hebrew Bible that was, uh, that was written long before he was ever born. Cyrus, the king of Persia. The Persian Empire was a huge empire. The Iranians today identify themselves not with Arabs, but with Persians. The Ottoman Empire, which was centered in Constantinople, which became uh, Istanbul once they took it in 1453, they overthrew the Ottoman, they overthrew the, the Byzantines, and in 1453, the, uh, the, Ottoman, the Ottoman Turks moved in with their Islamic Empire, and it was one of the largest and longest-lived empires in all the world. And it started, in, and, 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 it, uh, and, it, and it covered a huge amount of land, and it was centered in Istanbul, Turkey. These people are not Arabs. Now remember tonight, it's very important to understand that a lot of people have the idea that, uh, that the Arab is the centerpiece of Islam, but not necessarily. Iran is Shiite Muslim, and Turkey is Sunni Muslim. Turks do not identify with Arabs. Just a few days ago, Turkey began to fire on ISIS. They sent out their F-16s and their military hardware, and they begin to fire, they begin to, to begin to attack, strike ISIS in Syria and some of its positions. ISIS is made up mostly, uh, at least as it was from the beginning, of Arabs, but now they've got people coming from all over the world that are making up ISIS, the Islamic State. But Turkey has no qualms at all about firing on and wiping ISIS from the face of the earth. Do you know why? They want to be the power in the Middle East. Since the United States has pulled out, they have dreams now of the restored Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire lasted all the way to World War I, and they made a mistake by choosing the wrong side. <laughs> And when they chose the wrong side in World War I, of course, the Germans lost and, the, and, the, and Austria and the uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire, their country, whatever that, they lost. And when they lost, uh, the Ottoman Empire essentially was done for. In 1922, the last caliphate 
of the Ottoman Empire ceased to exist when Ataturk became the, uh, became the prime minister, king, whatever he was, the ruling power in Turkey. But their dream of an empire has never died. They want another empire. Once you've had it, it's hard to give it up. It's like Great Britain. At one time, the sun never set on the British Empire under Queen Victoria in the 1800s. They would like to see that day come again when the sun never sets on the British Empire. But then you have to deal with Iran, the Persians, because the Persian Empire at one time was a huge empire that covered the area around the Mediterranean Sea, on up into Europe, and on into the east. And so what we have here are two competing ancient ideologies of people who at one time had empires, Iran and Turkey. Now, the, 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 and, and, and keep this in mind, the Iran is populated for about 75-80% by Shiite Muslims. And Turkey is populated somewhere along with that by Sunni Muslims. Then they have the minority Christians and Jews and, and what have you, uh, Zoroastrian and is in Iran you still have some Zoroastrians over there, this, that, so forth and so on. You've got some major players in the end time, but let me bring another one in for you tonight. That is the United States of America. In the book of Revelation it talks about Babylon. And it talks about Babylon burning and being destroyed. Now, for a long time, Bible scholars have wondered, well, where is this Babylon? Because right now, if you go to the Tigris and Euphrates River, the Valley of Mesopotamia, you cannot find ancient Babylon. Although Saddam Hussein did his dead level best to restore as much of it as he could while he was the, uh, while he was the dictator in Iraq. And it's there, and the ruins are there from ancient Babylon. But as far as that area right there being any kind of a political or military force, it does not exist. But there could be another country that stands for Babylon. Just like in the Bible, one person can stand for another. The Lord said of John the Baptist, this is Elijah if you'll receive him. So God can do that. We may very well be doing that in America. Let me read something to you. This is quite revealing. This is a remarkable statement. I've never heard this before, but listen to this. President Ronald Reagan said these words in 1971 to the state legislatures, and I'm sure the governor of California. He was the governor. Here's what he said. Ezekiel tells us that Gog, the nation that will lead all of the other powers of darkness against Israel, will come out of the north. Biblical scholars have been saying for generations that Gog must be Russia. What other powerful nation is to the north of Israel? None. But it didn't seem to make sense before the Russian Revolution when Russia was a Christian country. Now listen carefully. Now it does, now that Russia has become communistic and atheistic. Now that Russia has set itself against God, now it fits the description of Gog perfectly. Now let's fast forward to 2015. In, uh, in President Reagan's time, in 1971, that might have been so, but not now. Not now. A lot of people say that Vladimir Putin, when he professes to be a Christian, Russian Orthodox Church, it's all a facade for political gain, what have you. That's between him and God. But I know one thing. I know that the Russian culture and the Russian government will not put up with sodomy. They will not put up with what we are pushing in this country for a second. And that there has absolutely been a resurgence of the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia, and there are a lot of people over there in Russia now who are going to the to the to the churches, and that the government, the Rus that the government under Vladimir Putin is absolutely supporting the Russian Orthodox Church before the people. In plainer words, by, by by on the surface of it, it looks as if Russia has made a complete swing back and is now a Christian Christian country again. Now look at America. The Supreme Court of the United States just a few days ago uh, dictated to this nation of 300 and something million people that two sodomites uh, joining together uh, constitutes a marriage. We've had 70 million babies butchered in this country at the hands of Planned Parenthood and no doubt others. And just, the, just in the last few days, Planned Parenthood has been caught uh, on video selling the body parts of these little children. America is one of the worst countries in the world for child molestation and child sacrifice, satanic child, child abuse. It's going on all the time. Here and there, someone will rise up and say something about it. 
And, uh, and, when the, and sometimes when they do, you don't hear them again because they're dead. It tells me that there's something going on in America. The churches in America are dead, twice dead and plucked up by the roots. They will put a baby-killing Marxist communist in office and they'll vote their belly. There are no telling how many, uh, how many church people, religious people in this country that go to church week after week after week that will walk into a voting booth and vote for a Democrat. I got an email from a man the other day and he said, I'm a Democrat. And he said, I'm a Christian. And he said, I forgive you for being so mean to the Democrats. I thought, you don't need to forgive me. I don't want your forgiveness. I'm not asking for your forgiveness. I'm telling the truth. But I'm not telling you tonight the Republicans are going to save you. I'm telling you tonight that the Republicans, most of them, as far as my experience has been, are just as corrupt as the Democrats. In plain words, the whole political system in America is one stinking, rotten mess. Now make that plain tonight. Make that real plain. Please, understand me. This preacher up here tonight is not promoting the Republican Party. Not at all. Because we have, we have some of the most vile, wicked people on earth. Both Democrat and Republican. But the problem is this. It's not them. It's not the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. It's the Church of God. We're the light of the earth. We're the salt of the earth. We're the pillar and ground of the truth. Where do you go in this world to get the truth? Do you go to UT? You're not going to get it over there. Do you go to your senator, your congressman? You're not going to get it there. Uh, where are you going to go? Are you going to go out on the street corner and just get all the people together and say, what do you believe? What do you believe? What do you believe? That's not going to be the truth. Where are you going to get the truth? You're going to go to the educational system? They're not going to give you the truth. Where are you going to get it? If you don't get it in the church of God, you're not going to get it. That's our primary job is the propagation of the truth to get it out. The dissemination of the truth to get God's word out. That's what we're here for. This is why the church is called the pillar and ground of the truth. So in CERN, Switzerland, when you have these phantasmas or these apparitions, these things that are showing up over there, these things that are appearing, and these uh, physicists cannot explain it, it makes me wonder if Satan's not going to use what's happening in CERN to s mix the seed, mingle it with the seed of men. I believe we're at that point. And I believe we're at the point now where we need to be looking very carefully for the coming of the Antichrist. Amen. Let me tell you what the Muslims teach. By the way, let's see what President George Bush said about this. In Prelude 2003 invasion of Iraq, President Bush told Jacques Chirac that Gog and Magog were at work in the Middle East. This confrontation is willed by God, he told the French leader. Who wants us to use this conflict to erase his people's enemies before a new age begins? Chirac consulted a professor at the Faculty of Theology at the University of Lucerne, Switzerland, to explain Bush's reference. What is Gog and what is Magog? Now, I've got a Schofield Bible, and this is a Schofield Reference Bible, uh, and Reverend C.I. Schofield, and the notes in Schofield's Reference Bible are outstanding, but he's not always right. He's not always right. And he says plainly that Gog and Magog has a reference to Russia. This is why President Reagan, when he was the governor of California, said the power that is to the north of Israel. And he said, what power is there north of Israel? It has to be Russia. There is another power north of Israel. That's Turkey. Turkey is a powerful country. Turkey is not Syria. It's not Iraq. It's not a pushover. If the United States wants to, it went to war with Turkey, it would cost us something. It would cost us. It's not, a, it's not just, a, a, just a passing uh, fluke. As a matter of fact, Turkey is a member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, formed after World War II to combat the movement of Soviet Russia into Europe. So we've got a situation going on here now where... The Islam or the Muslim world is primary in the news of all the world. How many believe that tonight? It's all about what's happening to Islam. It's, what's, about ha it's what, what's happening about ISIS. What's happening in Syria? What's happening in Egypt? What's happening in the, is in the Muslim world? It would behoove us tonight to find out what they believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. What do they believe about him? 
They believe he's real. They believe he lived. And they believe he's a prophet. He is real. He lived. And he is a prophet. How many agree with that tonight? If you're a Christian, you know he's a prophet. But you see, the problem is that the Muslim has his own take, his own peculiar spin on who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Now, without getting into a long thing, I just want to read a few words here about what they say about him. Like all prophets in Islam, Jesus is considered a Muslim, one who submits to the will of God. That's what the word means. In other words, it's like this. Muslim is one who submits. Islam means submit. The ones who have submitted, that's Islam. So, uh, as he preached that his followers should adopt the straight path as commanded by God. Traditionally, Islam teaches the rejection of the Trinitarian Christian view that Jesus was God incarnate or the Son of God. They deny that. They do not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They do not believe God has a Son. When we say Trinitarian view, we mean by that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And when we say that, we mean that the Godhead, that the Lord Jesus Christ was bodily present with us, the Godhead fully bodily present in Him. We believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost constitute the Godhead. One God, hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, one Lord. But he manifests himself forth as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And 2,000 years ago, God Almighty became a man. And when he became a man, he incarnated himself in flesh. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God of very God. We believe that. Fully God. But a Muslim does not believe that. He denies that. Now, I told you before that Muhammad, when he wrote the Quran. He laid the Old Testament down on one side and he laid the New Testament down on the other. Both were in existence. The canon of Scripture was completed in the New Testament by 90, 95 A.D. Uh, when the book of Revelation was written. That closed the canon. Now more stuff was written after that. But the canon of Scripture, in plain words, the complete Bible was finished along about 90 to 95 A.D. That's a long time before 600 A.D. Muhammad lived in the 600s A.D. And he wrote the Koran said it was dictated to him by Gabriel. And so he has the Old Testament in one hand, and he has the New Testament in the other hand, and he produces the Koran. Then he follows up with the Hadith. The Hadith is his commentary on the Koran. So this is, what, uh, this is the book, the holy book of Islam. Islam is broken up into two basic groups, and it's important to understand this. Now there are subgroups, but the two basic groups of Islam is Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. The Sunnis outnumber the Shias. There are more Sunnis than there are Shias. ISIS, that's cutting the heads off of little girls over there in the Holy Land, burning Jordanian pilots to death in cages, is Sunni Muslim. They broke when Mohammed died because of the progression of authority. Which would it go through? Would it go through his son, his grandson, or would it go through a caliphate? It'd go through someone else. And the Sunni followed the caliphate, and the Shia followed his grandson, and his son, his grandson, Ali. So the, the, the break took place uh, all the way back in the 600s. They've been broken apart since then. Sometimes they'll fight together. But the truth of the matter is they hate each other. They literally despise each other. So for an American to understand what's going on in the Holy Land and in, and in, Is, and, and in, and in Iraq and Iran and, and, Ked, and Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and all the rest of these places over there, he needs to understand that there is a big difference between a Sunni Muslim and a Shiite Muslim. The Muslims that bombed the World Trade Center, if, we, if, if what we got told was correct, if it was true, were Saudi Arabians, not Iraqis. Now why Mr. Bush went into, Saudi, went into Iraq to take out Saddam Hussein, who had nothing to do with it, is a mystery. It may not really be a mystery, but on the surface of it, he went into Iraq to remove a vicious dictator. But the people who bombed those towers were Saudi Arabians. They were Sunni Muslims. And many of them came from a sect in Saudi Arabia that's called Wahhabism. Wahhabi. That is a, that is a, that's a radical group within the Sunni Muslim community. So when we look at the Islam, the world of Islam, and a Muslim says to you, Oh, I believe in Jesus. They call him Issa. I believe in Jesus. 
And I believe he's a prophet. And I believe he was virgin born uh, by the Virgin Mary. Then you say, my goodness gracious, he believes what I believe. But you've got to be very careful what he's saying. Because when they finish up, they're not talking about the same Jesus that I'm talking about. They believe that when he went to the cross, that he literally didn't go to the cross, that they took somebody in his place and that they were crucified and not Jesus. Jesus to them is just a man. He's a prophet like Muhammad. He's not divine. He's not the son of God. But here's the thing about Islam that's so important for us. It's their eschatology. The, the, the doctrine of the coming of their Mahdi, or they even call him in some cases Messiah. It depends on what group you're talking to. It's important to understand this tonight. When somebody says, what do the Jews believe? Which Jew? Somebody said, what do the Muslims believe? Which group? What do they believe about the coming of the Messiah or the coming of the Mahdi? Who are you talking about? That's what you've got to do. You've got to find out which group you're dealing with as it has to do with eschatology. But here's one of the basic teachings. And that is that the prophet Jesus is coming back to this earth. And when he comes back to this earth, he's coming back with the Mahdi. And the Mahdi is going to destroy the Antichrist. He's going to destroy the Antichrist. Christ is the Messiah. He's going to destroy him. Remember, when they say Messiah and I say Messiah, we're not talking about the same one. Don't get confused. It's like semantics. I say blue, you say blue. Blue to me is not blue to you. Your blue is not my blue. You following me? You can play with words, and that's what's happening here. When they talk about the Antichrist, they're more than likely talking about the true Christ. For the true Christ to them is an Antichrist. You follow me on this? It gets, it gets into the idea that depending on what group you're with is what you're looking for. And according to the word of God, the Lord Jesus is coming back again. No doubt about it. He's coming back again. I believe it. I believe that Gog and Magog fit into the end times. I firmly believe that. But here's, the, here, here's, here's a twist on it. Now, as, as, uh, as Brother Schofield, and he was one fine, outstanding man, no question about it, a Christian, love the Lord. He teaches that Russia is Gog and Magog. And that Russia is going to come down from the north and they're going to attack Israel. I saw an ancient map the other day I'd never seen before. And it showed the area of Constantinople, Istanbul. And it had the word Gog and Magog across the top of it. In plain words, here was another take on where Gog and Magog was located. This was an old map. So what are you saying? I'm saying that there's a good bit of controversy tonight about Gog and Magog. That it's possible that it's not Russia. Now, 40, 50 years ago, I mean, some folks would have considered that to be blasphemy. <laughs> uh, some folks think that any time you disagree with them, you're a blasphemer anyway. <laughs> some folks are so adamant in their, in their position. You say, well, then wait a minute, preacher. If Gog and Magog is not Russia, but it is at Constantinople, what country is that? Remember what I told you? Constantinople is the capital of... It's not the capital. Ankara is the capital. But it was the ancient capital of the Ottoman Empire. And who is the modern-day country that's connected with the Ottoman Empire? Turkey. Exactly. And that's where the old churches of the churches of Asia Minor, there in Revelation uh, chapter number uh, chapters 3 and 4, they're all in Turkey. All right. Now... I'm not telling you tonight that I believe this, but I'm telling you tonight that it's worth looking into that we have Gog and Magog as Turkey situated up here who may very well be the power in the north that wants to come down against Israel. You say, well, now that puts a different light on it. A lot of things can change the light on it. For example, where's the Antichrist coming from? I don't know. But I know who he'll be. I know what he'll be. I know that when he shows up, he'll profess to be God. And I know he'll go into the temple of God. And where's the temple of God? 
where would it be? It'd be in Israel, in Jerusalem. There's only one place on this earth that you can build the temple of God. That's in Jerusalem at Moriah. He'll go into the temple of God and he'll profess to be God, showing himself that he is God. He is the Antichrist. So he's directly related with Israel. I'm not saying he's a Jew. I'm not saying he's an American. I'm not saying he's an Islamic Antichrist. I'm not saying he's a Russian. I don't know. I've been at this for a long time, and I've been observing prophet, prophecy teachers. And I, 40 years ago, when I started in the ministry, it was communism. Communism was the enemy. It was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It was from the communist nation that the Antichrist was going to come. And I heard it preached day in and day out, day in and day out. But it doesn't seem to be working out that way, does it? No. It's so easy to take a position on something based on your emotions or the school you went to or the crowd you run with. But the bottom line is we're not even sure who Gog and Magog is. And if you can't be sure about that, then how can you be certain about who the Antichrist is? Did you know that in America we've got people who are so qualified to be the Antichrist it's not funny? I don't want to sound mean to you, but we got a fellow up here in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He's about as qualified as they come. He's about as qualified as they come. Is he the Antichrist? I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know that to be so. Who knows that? But we need to keep our eyes open and keep watching and keep praying and keep listening. For he's about to show up. Now, I believe in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, it says that that day shall not come except that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That day is the day of Christ. All the new Bibles change that day of Christ to the day of the Lord. Curios. Hemera curios. Ha hemera ha curios. The day of the Lord. But it's not that in, the, in, the, in, the, in this, in this uh, uh, received text that your King James Bible is translated from. It's ha hemera ha Christos. The day of Christ, not the day of the Lord. They're not the same. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two entirely different things. The day of Christ will only run for seven years. That's it. And the day of Christ ends at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the heavens open and he comes in power and great glory. But the day of the Lord is a different thing entirely. The day of the Lord will run seven years, then it will run another thousand the day of the Lord will run through an entire millennium. It can run a thousand and seven years. The day of the Lord. Say, so why is that important? It's important because the church of God, that's us, will be here when the Antichrist begins to manifest himself and show his true colors as to who he is. We're going to see him right before we leave. Now, I'm going to tell you something. My own personal experience, my feeling about the matter. I have seen some people alive today that in my estimation are some of the most vile, wicked blasphemers on the face of this earth. And they fully qualify to be the Antichrist. And I'm not going to name a name. I don't want the men in black handcuffing me and hauling me out the back door uh, with, the, uh, with the Gestapo and putting me in a concentration camp and uh, all that because I'm not sure. Now, when it comes to preaching the word of God, if I, God tells me to preach about sodomy, God tells me to preach the book, I'm going to preach the book. If the men in black are standing at the back door. But I'm not going to do something foolish. You should have enough sense not to threaten somebody's life. But for some strange reason, people still do. You shouldn't threaten someone. I don't understand a generation that gets on Facebook and they open up their whole world and they get on there and they show photographs, videos, and stuff that would, that's a shame. And I don't watch it. Do you know how much time I spend on Facebook? Do you know how much time I spent on Facebook this past week? Do you know how much time I've spent on Facebook in the last year? Do you know how much time I've spent on Facebook since Zuckerberg started it and became a billionaire? Zilch. I'm not interested. What do you mean? 
I got better things to do than to stick my nose into when you got up and what you had for breakfast and who you think's dating so and so and who ran away, run off of somebody and who did this and who. I don't care about that junk. Lord of mercy, man. Why do, why do you got your mind all tied up in that stuff? Good night. Get a life. <laughs> Crying out loud. Go fishing. Do something. But there are people who get on that. They, they fire up Facebook in the morning and they sit there and their eyes are bulged out and they sit there all day long. And buddy, it's one, it's one story, it's one scandal, it's one uh, gossip session after another. I, I'd go screaming mad. If I, had, if I had to live in Facebook world, I'd go, I'd go off the deep end. Now, I know Facebook can be used for good. There's a website on there that's got me, Charles Lawson, on Facebook. I did not put that on there. I had nothing to do with that. I did not do that. There's one on there that says Temple Baptist Church. I, we did not, I did not do that. I had nothing to do with that. People on there, they post the services. They post the preaching. They post the singing. They post it on their Facebook and they post it on YouTube and all that. That's all fine and good. That's all well and good. That's all fine. Anytime you get the word of God out, that's a good thing. But when it comes to me personally, I don't have any time for Facebook. I have no time for it. My wife calls it fake book. And she's pretty good at stuff like that. Fake book. <laughs> now, uh, most, a bunch of you, no doubt, in here are, are, are uh, uh, faithful fa fake book, uh, uh, what do you call them, observers or participants or whatever. That's fine if that's your life. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, I lived a long time before there was a computer. I started out with a party line in our house. We knew who was calling by the number of rings. Two short, one long. Oh, that's the next door neighbor. Pick it up and see what they're talking about. You know. How many know what a party line is? <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. That's the world I grew up in. You better believe it. So, you know, things have changed a lot since then. A whole lot. And I just don't have time for it. I spend my time doing some research and studying and this and that and so forth and so on. And I thank God for it. But I'll tell you something. There's something moving in me tonight. I feel it. I feel that we've crossed a line in our country. I really do. I, I believe we've crossed a line. I believe we've crossed a line. And I believe the Supreme Court uh, put that line out there. And I believe our nation has crossed it. And I don't know that we'll ever go back across the line. I really don't. I think that our nation now has pretty well sealed its doom. And I believe that uh, the Bible prophecy relating to Babylon could very well be the United States of America. And I believe the United States of America could very well be the homeland of the Antichrist. Wouldn't it be something if he arose from this nation? And he's, uh, he could. He could. We're that close to the coming of the Lord. So I want, you to, I want to give you my position tonight on these things. I don't know where the Antichrist is coming from. I don't know who he is. I don't know that uh, I don't know when the rapture is going to take place. I have no idea what that's, when that's going to happen, but I know it's coming and I believe it's coming soon. I feel it in my soul. And that's the next event on God's calendar is the rapture of his church. A lot of people say, now preacher, the gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to the ends of the world before the Lord can come back. That's talking about the revelation. That's talking about the end of the tribulation period. The Bible says the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We have 144,000 male Jewish virgins out here preaching the everlasting gospel. Angels flying through the heavens. All this stuff is going on. And the gospel of the kingdom is being preached in the tribulation. But not now. Amen. Not now. We're preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And not a single sign, nothing has to happen before we're caught up to meet him in the clouds. That's what makes it so wonderful that it could happen at any moment. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, this week, this month, uh, a lot of people are looking at September the 23rd or so, the month of September as a time when something astounding is going to happen. A lot of people out there talking about blood moons, uh, shamatas, and all these things. I'm not discounting them. But I'm going to give you a warning tonight. Be awful careful when you start setting dates. Because when it doesn't happen the way you've got it all planned out, an awful lot of people are going to be let down and it's going to affect their faith. 
And a lot of well-meaning people get caught up in this stuff and they really believe it's going to happen and it doesn't happen the way they think it's going to happen. Don't get caught up in it. Just keep that earnest expectation that at any day the Lord Jesus could come back and catch us up to meet him in the clouds. But we do not know the day or the hour. But I do believe this. I believe the times of the Gentiles are just about over. I believe it's about finished. I believe we're on the verge of a cataclysm in this world like the world has never known. And it's going to bust loose. And when it busts loose, the whole world is going to be crying out for a Savior. And I told you, the Hegelian dialect is that you have a thesis, then you have an antithesis, an antithesis or an antithesis, which produces a synthesis. And that's exactly where we're headed. We're headed to a point where the whole world cries out for somebody to bring us peace. And the man of peace is going to show up. And he's the Antichrist. Don't take his mark. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word. Bless what's been said tonight. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. Amen. There's one thing about all that I've said tonight, and that's this. That the coming of the Lord is imminent. It can happen at any moment. With no warning. We need to be ready. The scripture teaches plainly that when the Lord comes back again, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage and building and selling and trafficking. And they were engaged in their lives and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. That's exactly where America is right now. Exactly. Last thing on their mind is the coming of the Lord. To them, the Bible, God, and the church is irrelevant. That's exactly where Satan wants them.